you so far, hasn't it? <laughs> Thank you, Crystal. Thank you, Hannah, Lane, Taylor, David, Sean, Brandon, back there on the drums. Um, Brandon and Matt back there on the wheels of steel, and, uh, and Taryn changing this. It's been, it has been a community that has built this, and it is a privilege to get to be a part of whenever God's love just radiates, ripples through a place, and we're standing this morning at the beginning of a beautiful journey together uh, to see what happens when we live in God's love, reach out into our world, try to make it a better place, to see what happens when we say the word open a thousand times in one morning. Um, <laughs> see that? So let's jump into the fun stuff right here. Um, you all remember middle school, right? Okay. <laughs> it's fun. Um, the land of blemishes and braces and body spray and that four feet away body sway slow dance that you do in middle school. Let's just say there is a reason that you've never heard of a middle school reunion. Right? <laughs> you may be in middle school right now, and so just on behalf of like this whole group of people here, um, stay strong. <laughs> it gets better, y'all. It does. So just to help us feel a little bit better about things, I brought a picture. Um, it's one of Does anyone know who that is? It's George Clooney. It is George Clooney in middle school. So I just want to prove to you, if George Clooney doesn't look cool oh in middle school, then no one oh looks cool. No one is totally comfortable in their own skin, their own clothes, with their cracking voice. No one knows who they are, even though we desperately want to. We are all figuring it out. We're thirsty to find out who we are. And I know all of you are super cool now. But back then, we were figuring it out, weren't we? At the same time, we were trying to figure out all those in-sync dance moves. There was a lot of figuring things out in middle school. And that's why I think when you stepped out in the cafeteria, you saw all these little islands of identity around the room, these little circles and bunches of people that formed up together. The, the athletes, the banders in one place, the, skate, the skaters, the roller skaters over there, which is the cool table where you want to be, of course. We start labeling ourselves and drawing circles around ourselves and around others, trying to define ourselves and each other by, by who's in, who's out. Adult life, I think, kind of looks like this sometimes, too. You step out with your tray, and you look around desperately for a place where you can be who you truly are, to know others, to know yourself, and to know yourself as a part of something bigger. Because we know that those circles and those divisions and those labels are not how things are supposed to be. Divisions by age, race, class, identity, orientation, zodiac sign, whatever. Those things are not the way that the world is supposed to be, because deep down we know that we are so much more in the circles, and the labels we put on ourselves and that others put on us. We're more than that. A part of us is thirsty and longs to know, to be known for who we truly are. And to know others in that same way that thirst is in our spirit. And when, truthfully, when religion gets mixed into that circle, drawing thing that gets kind of messy. When you don't feel like you can be who you truly are, that because of who you are, how you think, how you love, because your life isn't perfect and your kids aren't perfect, because you've been through some stuff, maybe, because you don't know a lot about this God thing, you're not sure why there's so many different Johns in the Bible, <laughs> um, Malachi, Malachi, you know, what is this? So maybe you feel, maybe you've heard that the doors are closed to you, that God's love is closed to you. That God is close to you. And so it's our deepest stuff comes from these experiences and from these messages. Our spirit is thirsty, though, but we feel outside. Maybe you've heard that message. Maybe you felt that. But I want to say clearly this morning, that is not the heart of God. Our God is love, as we proclaimed today. Our God is open to all, open to you, at work in you, no matter what. The God who created you loves you. And your uniqueness is not a fault. Your uniqueness is because our God is a creator and not a duplicator. Amen? God loves you. The depth of your spirit, the truth of who you are, no matter what. 
We see the heart of God in action in Jesus. His invitation over and over was simple and wide. All people, anyone, whosoever, all who would come, come and find life. Jesus threw the doors open wide over and over. And people would say, okay, that's probably wide enough right there, Jesus. And he would push them a little bit wider. Because when God says all people, God means all people. As Hannah read to us from Romans 8, nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ. And we cannot say that truth enough. Nothing separates you, even, even if your daughter on your watch ate cat food. <laughs> and you haven't, uh, haven't quite told your wife, I think there's, she's okay, she's good, this is post cat food. Seriously. So the first followers of Jesus got this message. Their world, their view of the world and of themselves was blown wide open by their encounter with this God who loved them incredibly. And you can hear the exuberance and the open revelation in the text that they left for us. And so here's one from Galatians chapter 3. It says there's no longer Jew or Greek. There's no longer slave or free. There's no longer male or female for all of you. All of you are one in Christ Jesus. All are one in Christ Jesus. They exclaimed with everything they were, with the communities they built. But humanity over and over is always catching up to the grace-filled, open heart of God. And that's why what we're doing here is so incredibly important. That what you and we are doing here, what God is doing in this community is important. That as we get to know God's radically loving heart, God's radical love and experience that are for ourselves, that we're shaped by it, that we get a chance to lift it up in this place and lift it up in our community through deeds and through words. To make this world more kind and gracious, creative, just, equitable, open, and loving place. To spread the kingdom of a God who is in love with this world together. That, that, is an important call in our hearts, and we do it together because we need each other. If, as Crystal says, all of us were created in the image of God, that means to glimpse this picture of God's love more fully, we need all of us together. In our diversity, to show us a more full picture of who our God is. And that is a much bigger and better table than anything in the middle school cafeteria. And that's where I want to sit with you. And that's where I want to invite those who are thirsty to come find life in the world of God. So I want to tell you a time, about a time, when Jesus threw the doors of the circle wide open. It's a story about Jesus seeking out a woman at a well and opening the doors wide for her and help her, helping her discover who she really was. And here's why this story is incredibly important. Because all of us have this list of things that we feel like separate us from the love of God, don't we? Maybe it's the cat food thing that you just keep wanting to get over. All of us have a list. Our culture has a list. I think a lot of times religion has a list. And if you had asked the culture and the religion of the day, of Jesus' day, what the list was, this woman that Jesus encountered, that he reached out to and sought after, would have ticked every single box on the list because she was a Samaritan woman with a past. And I know that doesn't mean a lot to us now, but if you'd heard that back in the day, you would have gone, <gasps> okay, so let's start together. <gasps> okay, good. Get out your shirts, fans, and start fanning yourself. It's getting hot. Those were at the top of the list. And Jesus went and found her and loved her and helped her understand her worth, opened the doors wide to her and invited her to life. So she was a Samaritan, which the reason that that's a big deal is because 750 years before this story, uh, Sargon the Great conquered the northern tribes of Israel and, and intermarried with the people there. So the people in the south believed that the people in the north were corrupted and impure and all of you know this stuff. It's amazing how our prejudices run deep. And they're old. And sometimes it's hard to shake off that middle school stuff, no matter what Taylor Swift says to us. So, Samaritan, that's strike one. Number two, strike two, she was a woman, which, believe it or not, back in the day, women were not always treated equally. I know that's hard for us to get our heads around. Um, 
They only made 73 cents on the dollar back then. And number three, she was a woman with a past. Uh, like so many people in vulnerable situations, she had to make impossible choices. And they followed her, and the community pushed her away. But if you were listening in these days, and you heard the story of what Jesus did, it would have been revolutionary. And that's why I think it's amazing where we find this particular passage of Scripture in John chapter 4. That means it's the beginning of the story of Jesus, that the followers of Jesus wanted to tell people about who Jesus was, and they put this story near the very beginning. Because it, defi- it shows us who God is, reveals Jesus' heart, and what God is up to in the world. And so here's how it begins. Jesus left Judea and set out again for Galilee. He had to pass through Samaria, it says. Now, I'm going to pause for the cause here. And Darren, can you put that map back up? If you look, Jesus didn't have to go through Samaria. And actually, that little red line is where every single Jew would travel to get from Judea, the lower part, up to the Galilee. They would go across the river where it was flatter and safer, but really they were avoiding Samaria. And so everyone else didn't have to go through Samaria. But it says Jesus had to go. That word had to is a little Greek word, dei. And it can mean necessity, but it can also mean that it was divinely necessary for Jesus to go to Samaria. It's the same word that Jesus uses when he says he had to go to the cross. That the heart of God goes to the places where people feel separated. Because that's who our God is. Jesus had to go to Samaria. To a place where people felt far away because our God builds bridges across separation. Our God heals those things, those wounds that seem like they cannot be healed. And when things are closed, our God opens us to life. So he arrives. This is what it says in the next verse. It says, it was about midday and a woman of Samaria came to draw water. This is a good subtle sign for us that it was midday. You don't go get water in the middle of the day. It's hot and it's hard to carry a bunch of water. You don't go in the middle of the day unless you really want to be left alone. And that's where she found herself, isolated from community. Maybe because others pushed her out. Maybe because she was just tired of the stink eye. But in the midst of all that, she was thirsty. And so here she was. And oftentimes that's where we keep those thirsty parts of ourselves, is hidden from others. But even in that hiddenness, there's this part of us that longs and seeks to be known, to know our creator and know who we are, looking for meaning, desiring to be connected. And we don't let people see it, but we carry it around like an empty water jug, just longing to be filled. So that's what makes Jesus' next question to her so incredibly profound. He says, give me some to drink. Please. I'm sure he said please. I'm going to tell my son, don't be like Jesus. Say it. <laughs> so it may not seem like much, but you see what this meant and what she says back to him. She says, how is it that you, who are a Jew, ask for water from a Samaritan woman like me? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans, and especially not women, and especially not those with a past. Something unexpected and boundary-breaking was happening. Boundaries were being crossed. And Jesus said to her, You are someone who's worthy of sharing the cup with. Think about what that story is telling us. Because this was as far apart as you get from God back in those days. And Jesus went to her, treated those boundaries like they did not exist, and sat down with her and said, You are someone worthy of drinking a cup with. So those places in you that feel like separate you from God, those places that you keep hidden, maybe those places that you feel will never be gone because of who you are, how you love, how you think, your story, who you are. Our God goes and finds you and says, you are worthy. And when you begin to realize how much our God loves you, that changes everything. 
So Jesus goes deeper, as we see here. It says, all who drink of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water I will give them shall never thirst anymore. He goes to what really the story is here. It's not about water. It's about this woman who's seeking and longing to be known and to be loved. And he goes on in the next verse. He says, if you knew the gift of God that I will give you, it shall well up inside you as a source of eternal life. It will well up in you. What he's saying to you is this, is that when you begin to be known by God and you realize how much God loves you, and you open yourself to that, to who you are, to the depth of your spirit, to the truth of who you are, as God begins to work in your life, it wells up in you, not from the outside, but from within as a source and a spring of real, true life. Because nothing can quench those thirsts. Nothing can fill you the way that your God can fill you. To be awakened to life and to purpose and to mission, to know who you were built to be and to be known by a God who loves you, it bubbles up from inside. Because there's nothing on the outside that can quench that thirst. Not labels, not circles, not achievements, nothing. The only thing that will fill us is to be known and to, be, and to know our creative God. So I was actually thirsty once um, for like two days. I was thirsty. And here's the story. Um, my dad, who's here somewhere this morning, um, he had, yeah, back there, back, He and I would go hiking on the Appalachian Trail uh, every summer and take a group of friends up there. We went hiking one particular summer during a drought in Georgia. And usually when you get to your campsite, there's a spring there and you replenish your water, you fill it up and you go on and you hike the next day. When we got to the campsite, there was no water. And every time we were supposed to cross a stream or a river, it was as dry as a bone. And that's cool for like a day. <laughs> but on day two, it starts getting a little concerning. Um, and then, then as day two progresses, it starts getting a little dire. It starts getting a little loopy in the midst of this stuff. And so we're hiking on this journey together. And all of a sudden, our friend Stan, who's in front of us, says, um, it's a bee. And runs after the bee off the trail through the woods. And I'm like, okay, so this is how we're gonna go. This is the end of my life. It's just a bee through the forest. But what we didn't know, what we, we knew this, that Sam, uh, Sam was a forest ranger, and forest rangers know that bees know where to find water. And so he chases this bee through the woods, and sure enough, that bee leads him to this little tiny mud puddle in the middle of the woods. And normally you'd be like, but we were like, yes, hallelujah. Let's get out our bandanas. Let's get our t-shirts. We started straining this mud puddle to get water. And what we were left with was the sweet nectar of brown, nasty water. And we drank it like it was Dr. Pepper, right? And it filled our thirst for a little while. I was thinking about that, what it means to be thirsty. And I was thinking about it in that same season of my life. I chased some stuff through the woods looking for things that would fill me up and quench my thirst. I went to some muddy puddles and drank water. And it filled me for a little while, but it left me sandy and salty. But when God began to reach out, when I began to open my heart to a God who was always there with me and invite me to be a part of something bigger and something more and discover who I was and how that fit in God's mission in this world and spread that with our world, something began to dwell up inside me and that thirst was replaced by living water. And it is an ongoing daily journey. But let's just say that on those days when I'm open to the God who's open to me, it is truly a spring of life fulfilling, bubbling up, antioxidant rich, whole 30 water for the center of my life. So this woman heard this invitation. She heard God's incredible open love to her. And she had some doubts, like us. And so she asked these important questions. She said, Sir, I see that you're a prophet. Well, our ancestors said, they used to worship on this mountain, but the Jews say that we have to go to this other mountain in Jerusalem. Basically, she's saying, okay, that's awesome, but I've been told for a long time that I'm not doing this the right way. What do you want from me? And Jesus says something remarkable, because Jesus says that God is open to worship in many ways, in many places. But what God is looking for is you, authentic you. He says the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeks such as these to worship Him. To worship means just to offer yourself, to open 
yourself. And it can happen in a place like this, but it happens in our lives too as we become open to who God is, to be a part of that story. And what God seeks from us is people who worship, who open themselves to the depth of their spirit and the truth of who they are. God is seeking us, inviting us to be authentic and open before our God and to experience the love of God for us. And that's amazing. But that's what God wants from us. That means that we, all these things we thought we had to do to be a missionary, to be a monk, to complete a mission to Mordor, all the things we had to do to get God to love us, God wants you, period, as you are, just as yourself, and invites us to worship God from the depth of our spirit. It says that God is seeking us. Not get your whole self together and then to come talk, but no, open yourself right now. Because God sees you, God knows you, your whole story, and believes that there are more chapters to write, and he will walk across Samaria to find you. Our God sees you and loves you. And when you realize and open yourself to that, it changes everything. It quenches thirst. So my mom was a a school teacher, and toward the the end of her her productive years in the world, um, she's back there. She, uh, she uh, that's, that means before she went into administration, she was actually on the ground in classrooms. Um, she taught at an alternative school, at an alternative school. And, and the kids there had, it was pretty tough. And um, she taught math, but she decided that she also wanted to teach art to these kids, um, to give them some beauty and some creativity in this world. And so she uh, started working with the kids and teaching them to draw. And they were doing a great job, like drawing boots and all the things you do in Texas. And then she, uh, she starts to teach them how to draw a self-portrait. And all of a sudden, it was like reverting back to grade school again. You just draw a circle and some circles for eyes and a nose and a mouth. They couldn't see themselves. So mom decided that she was going to... Um, kind of show them how to do this. There was a kid named Daquan who happened to be suspended. He'd had a pretty rough go of things in school and just never connected with anyone else. And since he was suspended, Mom had a picture of him, and so she started drawing his picture. It, it turned out okay, and so he came back to school and he came, showed up in her room that first day he was back in the morning and he said, I heard you dreaming. <laughs> she was like, Yeah, I did, Daquan. Can I see it? Sure, come on over here. And she pulls out this picture and she sits it on an easel. I've got a picture here, that's Juan. And he looks at this picture of himself and it's really quiet. And then he gets really close. And he starts looking at it. And he says, That's my hair. Those are my lips. That's my nose. You did that thing with my eyelids where one dreams down. That's me. Mom realizes what's happening in this moment. See, Juan's father had been in prison for his adolescence. He'd been from house to house, living with aunts and uncles and friends and cousins and probably other places than that. And it had been a long time since someone had really seen Juan. And someone had really seen him. And as he came face to face with the image of who he truly is, it was proof that someone saw him and knew him and loved him and thought he was beautiful. And I wish I could say that from that point forward, he never got in trouble and now he's president of the United States. (laughs) It didn't turn out that way, but something changed in the on that day. It's like a wall came down. And he was open to my mom and open to his classmates in a way that he never had been before because he knew he was seen and known for who he was and loved. Children of God, no matter how far away you may feel separated, no matter what your story, your identity, God sees you. Sees your hair and your nose and the way your eyelids do that thing. God sees you and loves you and knows you and invites you to open yourself to a God who is open to you. So for this Samaritan woman, 
that day she knew that she was seen and known and loved by God, and that changed everything. It says she dropped her, her bucket of water and ran back to the city to tell people about this guy that she had met who knows her. She went and faced the very people who had cast her out because she was no longer afraid. Because she knew when the God of the universe knows who you are, knows your name, and knows you and loves you, what do you have to be afraid of? And so she starts telling people about this guy, and this is what she says. I love this. She says, come and see someone who's told me everything that I've done, who knows me. Can he be the Christ? <laughs> so like after this encounter, she's like, he might be Jesus. I don't know. And I love because this does not say to us that we need to have all of the answers and have everything figured out and know the stuff and believe it completely. But what we need to do is know that we are loved and to be open to spreading that into our world, to making this world a more kind and beautiful and creative and just and loving and open place, to see the people around us the same way that God sees you, to see them for who they are, the beauty of who they are, and help them discover that because as we get to know the heart of God it shapes us and informs us and our heart begins to beat like God's heart and we too will be people of incredible radical love of gracious hospitality and of openness to God and to each other and when we discover that when we, this room, begins to live that out, a spring of bubbling, antioxidant rich, whole 30 living water will begin to spring up in this place, in our lives, and in our community. Because that's what our God does. Let's pray together. Gracious, loving God, what a thing to stand before your love, to dream about who you are, to listen, to rest in that. God, you are love and you love us. God, thank you for your life. God, thank you for your love. But most of all, God, thank you for not letting those boundaries we think separate us, keep us away, but finding us, walking through Samaria to find us, sitting with us and telling us that we're worthy of sharing the cup with. God, what amazing love. And so, God, we dream about what it's like to be a part of that. We dream about what this space will become, what this community will become as we share your love in our world. God, help us be your people. God, make this message of your open heart be heard by the people who are thirsty to hear it. God, help us hear it, know it, believe it, and live in you. We pray all of this in awe of who you are in awe of what you're doing, and in awe that you invite us to be a part. We pray this in your name. Amen. So in your seat, um, you have uh, a circle there. And here's what I want to invite you to do. There should be a pen. If you're back in the back, um, you can, uh, uh, I don't know what to do. <laughs> back there, find something to write on, find a napkin or something like that. We've been dreaming about this. We've been dreaming about what God's going to do. We've been dreaming our prayers for this place, for open and for this message and all that it means here, but most of all, what it means in our community. And we want to invite you to dream in the same way. And so if you're moved to do this, you don't have to. This is not mandatory. I want you just to write in your dream, your prayer for this community, for what God will do, for what will happen, for who we will be together. And you can come up during this next song and put it in the red basket. There's a red basket back in the back on the table, too. Or you can, you can hang out and save it for after uh, together. It might be a little tricky to get around in some places. Uh, but just share it with us. We want to dream. We want to pray those prayers with you. But most of all, we want to live this out in the power and the grace and the love of God together. You can also, um, after the service, or during this response time, put your connection cards in these red baskets. You can, one of the ways that we respond and be a part of what God is doing is by supporting that with our, our time and our resources. And so if you want to make a contribution um, to help spread this word, you can put that in the basket too. Uh, you, there's some other ways to get it. You'll find it on the connection card too. But this is an opportunity for us to embrace this message. It could be a prayer for yourself. It could be a prayer for the people around you. It could be a prayer for our world. 
but let's dream together of what will happen when we, as God's people, begin to live out the beauty of God's open, radical, all-welcoming love. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. 